First Peter chapter 2, 13 through 17, as we look at God's word together this morning. Let's read the word of God. It says this. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Let's pray, shall we? Father, this morning, we just thank you for your word. As we come to this portion of scripture, just pray that the Holy Spirit will speak into our hearts. Just teach us. Help us to understand. Help us to be receptive as we see what God's word says this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just before I start this morning, I want to thank Didier for preaching last week as uh, he brought God's word to us again, a very powerful word. We thank him for that. If you can pass that on to him, that we, uh, we thank him. Uh, brought the uh, next message, as it were, in the passage which I was looking at prior to that. Um, I didn't realize he was going to do that, but he did bring it. Uh, verses 9 uh, through 12 last week. Chosen to shine for Jesus was his message. And if you haven't heard it, go online. You can hear it. Uh, if you're on the uh, text message that Gemma sends out, there's a link you can click and you can receive that straight away without going to the website. But again, uh, a very powerful message uh, talking about how we're chosen by God. And he, and he brought this fact of, of coming out of darkness being brought into the light, his glorious light. And I just want to reiterate the importance of that particular uh, part of Scripture, how it's for every single one of us. There's one word in verse 9 that's really important. It says, but you are a chosen people. You. He's referring to you and I. It's really important that we grasp hold of that particular word. You means you, every single one of you. Not just some of you or part of you. You all. Which means, not just for leaders, not just for pastors or clergy. We, you and I, are all chosen by God. We're, what we're chosen for? We're chosen, yes, to shine. But we're chosen to speak out about Jesus Christ. And it's all of our responsibility to spread that good news. So as Didier was asking last week, are you shining for Jesus? Or is your light a little bit dim right now? Well, hopefully in these days we'll begin to grasp the importance as, as we hear videos of testimonies, how people have been ministered to, by Christians coming into their lives. You and I need to grasp the importance that you and I are chosen for this particular task. So now as we come to this next passage of Scripture, we're going to talk about a, a subject that we've touched on before. I touched on this last year when we are looking through the book of Romans. We touched, I think it was about August when I looked at this particular topic. But it's a topic that's... Uh, not very easy to, to grasp hold of, particularly in this climate that we find ourselves in right now. And that topic is the topic of submission. And by the way, this is not just what we're looking at today and in the, the subsequent, subsequent weeks that we're going to look at who we to be submissive to. We begin the process as soon as we're born. Submission is something that I believe God has given because within the, the, the confines of submission there is freedom which we'll look at towards the end. 
soon as we're born as a baby, who do we become submissive to? Our parents. That, that's, that's what happens when, when babies are born straight into a family and then onwards and upwards into school life. You're submissive to teachers, to the authorities at school, and then to college, and then to work, where you go and work in the workplace, your bosses. This subject is in our lives from the moment we are born. So what does this word mean? Submission means voluntary attitude of giving in. Putting others first. To obey. The act of submitting to the authority of another person. Now you, you look at all those meanings in the confines of what we've just talked about from birth. This now is beginning hopefully to make sense. But over the next few weeks, we're going to see what biblical submission is. That's why I've called it godly submission. And to whom we should submit to in the Lord. And so that begs the question, who are we to submit to from a biblical perspective? Well, in the Bible it clearly points out different areas where we need to submit. And guess what? I'm going to start right at the beginning. James 4, verse 7. And again, you can write these down. James 4, verse 7, it says this. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. That's the beginning point. That's where we start. Submit yourselves to God. You know, every area of submission that the Bible talks about, I believe, begins with God. That's where it begins. And it's got to be seen from a godly perspective. Well, why do we say that? Because submission can be used in an ungodly perspective and can be used and influence by the devil. That's what that verse is about. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. In this whole area of submission, the devil is involved. I only have to think back to, you know, the war uh, and, and how this all began with a dictator called Hitler and how he wanted people to submit to him and how a world war was was conceived out of what he believed people should do and behave and be like towards him. I need to tell you, well, you probably know, that was an evil regime. Mm -hmm. It was evil. And that's not what I'm talking about. But we have to be aware that if we submit to God, then resisting the devil will be a lot easier. <laughs> He's going to get in. He's going to try and infiltrate this whole area of submission. So that's the first place we start. James 4, 7, submit to God. Ephesians 5, 21 says this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. God is the first place. Now we're looking at one another because of Jesus Christ. And by the way, this part of the passage of Scripture that Paul is talking to the Ephesians, Peter talks about a little bit later on in chapter 3, which we'll look at, which is in connection with wives submitting to husbands, which we will look at in God's perspective, in the good way, in the right way, not in the wrong way, in the evil way, which it can always be. So we submit to God, we submit to one another. And then in Hebrews 13, verse 17, it says this, Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. They keep watch over your souls as men who must give an account. Leaders in Christian life, in faith, this is those who God has put in place. 
those who God has set aside to lead the congregation. And again, it's a godly submission. I know you've heard and I've heard of those places, those churches, those organizations where, where the leader or leaders are dictators. And they come and they say, you should do this and follow me. As I was growing up as a Christian uh, and hearing about different movements that came out, there was one called the shepherding movement, where those who led a particular uh, sect of people, the leaders told the congregation what they had to do. And before they decided anything or, or did anything in their life, they had to consult with the leaders of the church. I mean, should I, should I buy a house? Should I sell a house? Should I do this? That was called the shepherding movement. That was ungodly. It is ungodly. And it's the wrong kind of submitting to authority. So you can see there's a right way and there's a wrong way. But the Bible is very clear. Obey your leaders and submit to their authority. In a godly submissive way to the leaders of the church is biblical. Anything outside of that is unbiblical and ungodly. And it's really important how we see this word submission today. And, and again, I want to keep saying it. Godly submission is very important. Yes, it can be a blessing. But on the other side of the coin, if it's ungodly submission, I believe it will definitely bring calamity on any situation. And by the way, like with the church that I mentioned, this shepherding movement, you know, people have to check things against the Word of God. When, when those people followed, and I must admit, I did that as a Catholic. I followed Catholic dogma. Not biblical dogma, Catholic dogma. And there's a big difference. What should I have done? Prior to getting to 30 years old and, and being challenged by the Word of God. I should have checked these things out. I should have gone into the Word of God and checked them out. Unfortunately, the shepherding movement had people who just followed those leaders like they were being led on a leash. You and I have to check and line it up with the Word of God. So this morning, as we look at these verses, we're going to be looking at godly submission to the authorities who've been put to rule over us. Well, just by way of a little bit of background in, in, in terms of when this was written, he was writing this while the church in particular, Peter being part of that church, uh, was under persecution, which ultimately led up to the persecution under an emperor called Nero. Now, if you know about Nero in your history books, at about the same time Peter was writing this, Nero was the most evil ruler that ever lived on the planet. He murdered people, he murdered Christians, had them executed, all kinds of things. Uh, if, I, if I told you some of the things, you'd be absolutely horrified. Look it up and, and check them the things out that Nero did to Christians, human beings that will absolutely horrify you. And this writing that Peter was now putting down for you and I to look at was under this emperor Nero. He tortured all of these Christians and killed them. And as we See also in this time span later on, both Peter and Paul were both martyred because of their faith. But now, in spite of all of these persecutions, at the time of writing, let's look what Peter is saying. And he's not just saying it with that particular period in mind, he's saying it with the future in mind as well. Because as the future unfolds, as we know, there was some, and there will be, and there's going to be leaders that come under this category. And what he's saying is, submit 
to the government authorities, and again, to put it in modern day language and understanding, to kings, to queens, to presidents, to prime ministers, to governors, you name what they call leaders in any particular place, and you can put that name there. No matter how bad they are, in terms of who they are. That's what verse 13 be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor, a supreme, or to governors. And again, that's what the word of God is telling you and I. And if you remember, I mentioned it earlier, Romans 13, we looked at this together last year in August, I think it was. We talked about uh, this dynamic, not to the extent this morning that we're going to look at it, but it really is important that we really get the picture because this now is Peter talking about what Paul talked about. These are two of the most amazing writers in the New Testament that you could ever think about. Peter and Paul are saying the same thing. Romans 13 verses 1. I'm going to read it again, just to reiterate. Let every person, not just one or two or some, every person be subject or submissive to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good. That, by the way, is very important. We're going to look at that in this section here. And you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. That is important. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes. Uh-uh, we're in February, coming up to taxes. <laughs> for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honour to whom honour is owed. Again, Paul and Peter are very practical in their writing. Yes, they can be super spiritual. They can be, in, 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 in every area of life, they can be telling us what's right to say and do and behave. But also in a practical way, they are giving us guidance. In that passage, what do we see? What do we learn? And I hope it's a learning experience for us all. Pay taxes. Pay revenue. Respect leaders. Be submissive. And overall that, in 1 Timothy, I'm not going to read it, it talks about praying for those in authority over you. This is God's word for you and I. But as I said when I preached on this passage, there's an exception to what we're looking at right now. I was reminded of this on, on Wednesday night when we looked at a passage in Titus. We're having a, a devotion from the book of Titus uh, by Chip Ingram on a Wednesday night. And at the beginning of chapter 3, verse 1, it says this, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities to be obedient and be ready to do whatever is good. Again, that's important. Because when we see this subject, yes, it's God's command to be submissive to those who govern over you and I. We are to obey the laws of the land. That's again coming down into the neighborhood, to, to the authorities that run our, our states, the policemen and women who try to help us uphold law and order. We have to do all of those things. 
as long as those authorities are not opposed to or contradict the Word of God. Amen. This is so important this morning, guys. We need to hear this. I believe we need to hear this more than anything that we're going to talk about. Because I believe this is where we are right now. In this world that we find ourselves living in. If you have to obey the law of the land that forces you to violate a clear teaching of God, then God is to be obeyed without question, regardless of what the state says. Again, I'm going to read a passage of scripture. Going back to the beginning of the church. Going back to those who were the forerunners of leading you and I in this faith. I, I probably read this to you before, and it's Acts, uh, chapter 5, verses 27 through 32. This is now talking about the apostle Peter and those who are preaching the word of God. They were preaching and they got brought before the council. Verse 27. Those are the authorities. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charge you not to teach in this name, the name of Jesus. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, listen this, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witness to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey Him. Amen. That's the bottom line. Again, I wanted to make it perfectly clear. I want to make it clear where I stand. Uh, and by the way, I believe every Christian should stand in the same way. Because we're following on from Peter and the Apostles. And if Peter and the apostles stand on that word of God against what authority might come as opposed to the scriptures, you and I should be standing in the same way. And I want to make it clear where I stand with what is now opposed to God's word in the here and now. You've heard me say this before, I'm going to say it again. Pro-life. We have to be for pro-life. It's God's word that we uphold life. No exceptions. We have to be so strong on this. Marriage. Man and a woman. Guys, it was God's idea how he brought mankind into being. And it was God's idea when he said, a man will take a woman in marriage and be joined together as one. God's idea. When man starts varying that design that God gave, dodgy ground, sinful ground, judgmental ground. And that is what God says in his word. When we take God out of everything, the school, the courts, Praying. All of those things are biblical to pray to God, to pray to our Father. In the power of the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ. When somebody says, oh, don't pray in the name of Jesus. Sorry, I'm going to do it. You've heard me tell you, I'm going to do it. I've done it on a number of occasions and I've never been asked back again. Because they don't like you praying in the name of Jesus. But the word of God says this, guys. Genesis 1, 27. Male and female, he created them. 
No combination. I, I, I'm going to tell you, we have to be very careful where we're going with all this transgender mm -hmm. movement. And don't hear me wrong here, I want you to hear my heart. If anybody walks through this door, no matter what persuasion, whatever they are, we love them with the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. We love them. But when they hear the word of God preached from this Bible, and whether it's sin of fornication or adultery or whatever it might be, homosexuality or transgenderism, under the word of God, the Holy Spirit can convict them and their lives can be changed. I was listening to Moody this week and a, a lady called Janet Parshall was having this discussion about this subject. And she had a phone in and somebody came in on the phone and it was a guy who was a transgender. Was. You hear me say that? Was. Under the power and convicting presence of the Holy Spirit, God opened his eyes to the deception that was led into his life as an early boy growing up absence of a father turned him effeminate, that he wanted to go a different way. And when somebody came into his life and by the word of God pointed out what God's word said, he changed completely. Confessed to God, now living a heterosexual life. So don't tell me that God's word cannot change your heart, my heart, anybody's heart. Yes, we love them with the love of the Lord. But we have to preach the word of God. And if the word of God doesn't change or alter or they kick against it, then I'm sorry. Jesus' specific orders when he sent his disciples two by two. Go into the town. If they don't hear the word, wipe your feet and walk away. If they don't want to hear it. But it's not for want of trying and presenting what God's word says. But I think you and I now in this time, we need to be vocal. We need to be here as followers of Jesus Christ, saying and making a difference. Guys, the, these apostles, two and a half thousand years ago, got hauled before the authorities. I don't, I don't see a lot of Christians right now getting hauled before the authorities. There's coming a time. There's coming a time. And you and I need to be in this word so much, knowing that who we are in who we are, which will give us the strength to say and do anything. Amen. And that's what we have to get to. Because it's going to come more and more and more. Again, I, I mentioned a few weeks ago, banning gender-specific language. You can't say father or mother, a boy or girl, man or a woman. And when that Methodist minister closed with a man and a woman, it was an abomination to God. I wish you'd call it out. And you and I need to pray week in, week out for God's strength to give us the right words to say. When anything comes up, in love that we talk about, well, this is God's word. And this is where I'm staying. I, I, I'm not going to agree to disagree. I'm going to disagree. Amen. There's some places we agree to disagree on, on little things in the Bible. But there's certainly some areas I'm not agreeing with. So guys, in these days, we need to stand up and follow God. I quoted this many years ago. If we don't stand for something, we'll fall for everything. What are we falling for right now? We're falling for the lies of Satan that he's feeding into our spirits, you and I. So I don't know about you, I'm going to stand and stand firmly on his word. And I, and I know persecution is going to come. But having said that, 
And by the way, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, Jesus quotes Genesis when he tells the, the authorities, male and female, he created them. Jesus quotes that in Mark chapter 10. It's in red in my Bible. So it's important that we get it. That this is not just God in Genesis, this is Jesus in the New Testament. But, if it's not against God's word, there is one good reason why we must be submissive. Look at verse 13. Look at verse 15. What does it say? It says this. For the Lord's sake. Verse 15. For this is the will of God. So being submissive is good. If things are good and, and the right laws are put into place, it's the right thing to do. Because the Lord says so. And it's the will of God to do so. Whether, whether we like a person or not, whether we like a particular party or not, we have to be submissive. As I said right at the beginning, God is the author of submissiveness. When godly submission is exercised, then order will ensue and life and relationships will be lived as God intended, not in the way man intended. Right now, man is trying to dictate how you and I live, not just to us, it's like a kick in the face to God. He's trying to dictate to God how you and I live. And one day, God is going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me. And so as Christians, under whatever government we may find ourselves, as long as it's not contrary to Scripture, as long as we remain free, our responsibility is, verse 16, to live as people who are free, not using that freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Well, what does that kind of translate into? Yes, submission brings freedom. But it's not to be used as a cover-up for sin. There are Christians who said, now I'm saved, I can do what I like. No, you can't. We still have to be submissive to God. Yeah. Before anything. And God's word says we have to do certain things. If we don't listen to God and we're not submissive to submissive to God, then we're as bad as what the world is doing. And such views, I believe, lead to spiritual anarchy. Are we free? Yes. We're free from the guilt of sin and from the demands of the Old Testament laws and legal systems. But we're not free to do our own thing. The Bible says you and I have been bought with a price. We're not our own. If we're not our own, who do we belong to? We belong to the Lord Jesus. And if the Lord Jesus says something, and God says something, then we are submissive to those rules and regulations. No matter what we feel might be right or might be a good thing to do, it's got to be what God wants. We're free to submit to God and to serve others. Submission is a spiritual issue between you and God. And guess what? We need God's help because you and I are inherently sinful. And you and I have a rebellious spirit against authority. You don't think I'm telling the truth? Well, you look at a child that's being brought up in any home. It has a sinful nature, it's got a rebellious nature, it's got a sinful nature that wants to do wrong. Don't put your hand in the fire. Where's he going to put his hand? <laughs> right from the beginning of time, Adam and Eve were created by God and God said, you can do everything in this garden be part of everything that I've created, except for one thing. Here's the submission. Don't. Don't do this. Don't eat from this particular tree. 
Adam should have said, yes, God. I'll do whatever you want me to do. That's why that verse is so important right at the very beginning. Submit, submit yourselves therefore to God. God knew what was coming after he told Adam and Eve. Resist the devil and he will flee. If Adam and Eve would have resisted the devil, submission, I believe, would have been a lot easier than it is now. We inherit what Adam and Eve passed on to you and I. That's all the sin nature, not some, all the sin nature of everything that is wrong. That's why it's such a hard truth to obey in the Bible. Because it runs counter to fallen human nature. Well, as we come to a close today, how do we get to really understand this and apply it? Well, there's one who lived this principle of submission. And guess what his name was? Jesus Christ. As we'll see later in this chapter, Peter mentions Jesus as our example in verse 21. You know, though he was insulted, he did not retaliate. Though he was sinned against, he did not sin. Though he was humiliated, he never threatened to get even. Instead, he was submissive to his heavenly Father. His submission led to his crucifixion. And his crucifixion brought salvation to the world. Amen. Is that an amazing concept? Jesus' submission led to yours and my salvation. Can you imagine in the, in the garden when, when he knew he was going to, to Calvary? And it was about to all unfold. Oh, hang on, God. Whoa, 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 whoa. You, you mean I'm, I'm going to be nailed on the cross? Oh, hang on a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you mean I'm going to have a crown of thorns and be beaten? And not? not my will, but thy will be done. Amen. Submission. And it ended at the cross. Can we do what Jesus did? We can try. Because this may be one of the greatest callings as a Christian that you and I will have to try and live out. To be submissive to those in authority. It's our Christian calling. As we finish today, I want us to notice in this few verses, this text this morning, God is mentioned three times. Well, I believe Peter wanted you and I to focus on God. It's, it's not about your boss. It's not about your teacher. It's not about those in government. It's not even about the president. It's not about you. It's all about God. Amen. Submission is about God. Godly submission. Let me challenge you this morning. Have you submitted to God? Because all the other submissions in life will follow if you and I are submissive to God. Let's pray.